Hi, you're watching The House in the Lock on the Time Team official YouTube channel with me, Tony Robinson. Loch Tay, and the kind of view that draws people to Scotland. But the landscape isn't the main attraction for archaeologists Nick Dixon and Barry Andrian, who are much more interested in what they can see in the shallow waters around the edge of this loch. They're carrying out the first ever underwater excavation of a cranog, an artificial island built in the Iron Age. A structure that's now completely submerged, but originally would have looked something like this. This full-scale reconstruction was built as an experiment based on timbers discovered so far, but ideas could change as new discoveries are made. But what makes Oak Bank Cranog so important is that the preservation underwater is fantastic. All sorts of clues to life in the Iron Age are being discovered here. Unique 2,500-year-old wooden objects that only survive underwater. Not surprisingly, digging a site as rich as this has become a kind of obsession. Nick's been diving here most summers since 1980. Don't just leave everything scattered around. This summer's excavation was different. Husband and wife team Nick and Barry decided to run a field school. The students got to learn about underwater archaeology while they got extra help excavating the site. You guys are in control of the airlines, and that means you're in control of the people on the end of the airline. So if somebody goes out, messes up, you drag them back. We do. Having to both teach and excavate, time was at a premium. Right, this is platform people. This has all got to be done at lunchtime before people come down here in the water. This year's challenge was not only to unlock new secrets of the 2,500-year-old Cranog, but also to introduce a bunch of rookies to the realities and rewards of working underwater. In this Time Team special documentary, you'll be submerged into the world of underwater archaeology and visit an Iron Age house that hasn't been seen since prehistoric times. Are you ready? Stand by to dive into the Iron Age. This solitary jetty is the only clue to the underwater location of the 2,500-year-old remains. As usual, there's plenty to do to get ready for the excavation, including building a bigger dive platform before the field school students arrive. Yeah, this is a very frustrating time because we just spend so much time doing these sorts of jobs and you suddenly have to think, oh, I'm an archaeologist. So when we get underwater and really get on with the job, that's when it gets really exciting. But you have to go through all this. Um, you know, every year we have this problem. And the only reason we have this problem is, of course, because we can't work year round. Once we get the resources and the finances to do a, a year round job, then we won't have to go through this every year. We waste a week just setting the site up, preparing and everything else. And at the end of it, we waste another week tearing it all down again. This summer, though, six field school students have arrived keen to learn and help. An international group, including three archaeologists from Newcastle University, who are planning their own project. I'm here to learn how to do this, really, to try and convert land-based archaeology underwater to use for a particular project. Um, of the rest of the people on the project, Lawrence and Morton, I've both had a lot of diving experience and a lot of experience as archaeologists, but again, it's the same, the same story. Morton's done some underwater archaeology before, um, but the rest of us are here to learn how to do this. And is there a control point here or not? Penny's husband, Horacio, is an engineer from Argentina and one of two non-archaeologists in the group. Wow, what weather! Tricia Dodds, an archaeology undergraduate, has travelled all the way from the USA. It's maybe like a spring in Georgia. Southern <laughs> Belle that you are. <laughs> While Victoria Timberlake, an American living in London, is taking a break from her work as a charity fundraiser. I was very happy to be accepted on this field school because I, I everybody else is, a, is a, you know, is an academic, you know, is an archaeologist in training. So in a way, it's a real privilege. Understandably, they're all looking forward to diving a site dating to around 500 BC. The early Iron Age, a period that would have seen big changes for the people living around Loch Tay, 
a time when iron was replacing bronze to make stronger and better tools, and water levels had risen, forcing people here in the highlands to find new places to live and farm, a lifestyle long forgotten, but now preserved in fantastic detail in the cold waters of this loch. Although they're all competent divers, none of them have used a surface supply air system before. And the first thing they have to learn is how to vent the compressor and bleed the filters that ensure the divers get clean air. The pros and cons of a field school are, firstly, you're charging people to come, so that's putting money in the coffers to allow us to do this research in the first place. Also, it's very refreshing to be teaching people um, about what we're doing and hoping that they will go on and teach other people in future. It's the development of underwater archaeology. Um, the uh, downside, if there is a downside, is that it takes time away just from the excavation. You're not just concentrating on excavating a site now. Uh, I think most professional divers are familiar with using um, umbilical surface supplied air. I think for, for um, general archaeology it is a little bit different. Obviously it's not, it's not the first time it's been used. Looks a bit funny, looks like people are going down breathing off a garden hose. It's very different. They're used to diving wearing fins, but they can't hear in case they damage the fragile archaeology. You're basically, you're weightless, and you just got your hands and, well, feet to move around it. So what you used to do is just jump out and maybe swim a bit, or just kick out from the scaffolds, you know, just flying from scaffold to scaffold. At the beginning, it was um, a bit unnerving uh, in the, because it is such a wonderful site. Being very careful not to, not to damage anything. This is the area we're going to excavate this year, and it's, it's the floor of the house, an upper floor, and it's one of the most exciting parts of the house. We want to get underneath this floor. This is going to be the main bulk of our work this year. The floor collapsed onto the loch bed, an event that seems to have happened several times during the lifetime of the structure, creating many layers of archaeology that now need unravelling. It's going to be very exciting, I think. Every year is exciting. I've been coming here for, God, 23 years, off and on. Every time we come open a new area, we are the first people ever to see the fabulous things that we expose. And you suddenly think, my God, you know, it was 2,600 years ago, somebody put this down here or laid it down and then didn't come back to it. And it's all just out there, just under the water. If you want us to investigate more sites, you can make it happen. So, help us reach 10,000 members on Patreon. one of the field school and the beginning of what appears to be a heat wave in Scotland, making it a special start for the six trainee underwater archaeologists. Although most of them have dug on land, they've got a lot to learn about excavating a 2,500 year old Cranog, a type of Iron Age house that was built out on the water, but is now collapsed and submerged in Loch Tay. The quicker they learn, the more use they'll be on this long-term research dig, aimed at unlocking the secrets of this cranog, which, as the plan shows, is a very unusual shape. This is partly because the cranog was rebuilt several times, but also because this smaller structure, referred to as the baby cranog, is complicating the picture. These piles are the remains of the Iron Age walkway that led out to the cranog, and the shaded bits represent the areas that have been partly excavated. The students' first job is to start cleaning up this area, C2, where they'll be excavating the floor of the Cranog. The first thing they've got to get right is balancing the air in their suits with the number of weights they're wearing. 
I think I need more buoyancy practice just to get everything in. Yeah, I think Just uh, to be more elegant. <laughs> They're all on a steep learning curve, especially the non-archaeologists in the group. I had no idea what it was going to be like. Uh, I knew a Cranog was kind of a lake dwelling, and I'd seen pictures of Cranog, you know, of, of reconstructions of lake dwellings in Switzerland. So I had a very vague idea, uh, and then we went to the Cranog Center to see what you know the reconstruction looked like. By visiting this full-scale reconstruction built a mile or so down the loch, the students can get a picture of what a Cranog looks like. Cranogs are peculiar to Scotland and Ireland and are thought to have been built partly for status but primarily for defence. We built the Cranog for three main reasons. One was public awareness, let everybody know what a Cranog was. The second was experimental archaeology, show how all, it all fitted together. And the third was to make money so that we could do more of what we're doing now, research underwater. And all of these things still apply. As we excavate at Oak Bank, we find new things, we get more questions, and the reconstruction will develop as we develop our excavations at Oak Bank. This reconstruction represents the Cranog when it was first built, which, according to radiocarbon dating of timbers at Oak Bank, was between 400 and 600 BC. But after digging a section through the mound of archaeology right down to the loch bed, Nick has discovered that it was rebuilt something like six times over 200 years. Tantalisingly, the full story of Oak Bank Cranog appears to be perfectly preserved underwater in this loch. And Nick's committed to finishing this dig, even though it means painstakingly excavating its many layers over who knows how many years. The possibility of new discoveries from Oak Bank Cranog is fantastic. And you have no idea when you go down to start excavating what you might find. Many of the elements that we've discovered from Oak Bank are first discoveries uh, in this country. The student's first task is to clean off the silt here in area C2. Instead of shovels and wheelbarrows, they've got to get used to using a dredge, a device that hoovers up any unwanted material and a bit of kit that's not easy to come by. The flexible arms for them come from Austin Maxis. Up under the front wings of Austin Maxis, you get these black flexible tubes, which are the ventilation ducts, and you just rip them out and they're perfect. But unfortunately, there aren't many, many Austin Maxis. So we've had to go modern and get some other flexible material, which looks pretty good. My only slight doubt is that the yoghurt pots that I'm using to connect them together... With bit... funds in short supply, improvisation is everything here. And whether it takes yoghurt pots or cups from a thermos flask, the main thing is to keep the dredges working. The pump pumps water down the fire hose, comes out of the end and goes into here. This clips onto here. Then there's a water jet shooting backwards through here and that causes suction of the arms and all the spoil and stones and silt and so on is carried away off the site. With a thousand cubic metres of organic material preserved at Oak Bank, the students have to learn what to keep and what to put up the dredge. Everybody has to look at everything that they find and make a decision. Has it been cut? Has it got some value archaeologically? And if it hasn't, then they have to put it up the dredge and get rid of it. Many of the objects the students have collected so far are similar to things seen before, but typical of the kind of finds that make this site so important. Small details of Iron Age life that don't survive anywhere else, such as these pine tapers, rich in resin and probably used as fire lighters or small night lights. A taper burnt at both ends, or as Victoria said, a candle <laughs> designed to be burnt at both ends. <laughs> All sorts and sizes of wooden items have been discovered here, ranging from this whistle to tools thought to be used for farming. And one of the most important finds so far was discovered close to where the students are working. This is a wooden dish and when we first found it, we knew there was something interesting about it because there are holes in the bottom of it. And uh, after we'd excavated it, we realised that there was gloopy material sticking to the inside. So each of these little numbers represents where the stuff was thickest. So we sampled that, we sent it off and had it analysed and uh, the results came back and said it was butter. So we've got a wooden butter dish with the remnants of the butter uh, still sticking to the inside of it, which was very exciting. The special finds are reconstructed at the Cranog Centre and help tour guide Scotty Wilson to bring it all to life. And this is a replica of what the dish would have looked like had it been complete. He explains why so many Iron Age finds survive at Oak Bank. Now, it was no condition for your morning toast, but it was butter. 
and it had survived because of the preservation qualities of this lock and probably other Scottish and Irish locks. It is very, very cold. It is pity. Down there under the mounds of rubbish that has been falling through for many, many years, there is no oxygen. Bacteria and organisms do not survive that environment. Organic material does. And that is why in the exhibition, the organic material you're looking at is in virtual pristine condition, in a condition that would never have survived on a land archaeological site. But for Nick, Oak Bank isn't just about finds, it's about the challenge of understanding this complicated structure. The layer the students are cleaning up before they can dig through it is a collapsed floor partially excavated and drawn 12 years ago. This is quite an easy area to understand uh, because we can see there are floor timbers lying in this direction and lying across them are bigger timbers which are fallen supports for the roof and the walls and these wood, the stumps of these piles or the stumps of these uprights are along the edge of the floor here so you can see that one's fallen from here, that one's fallen from here and so on. We can make quite a lot of sense of this. Many of the floor timbers have been damaged by erosion and the student's job is to clear away the eroded top layer. In doing this, they'll be revealing patches of the new layer underneath. Already one of the rookie archaeologists reckons these sticks he's uncovered could be the remains of a hurdle, similar to the ones reconstructed at the Cranog Centre. The way it's made is just interweaving sticks of hazel like this with the uprights, and that's what gives it its support. Now, these were used by the Cranach people as partitions to divide up the interior of the house and also probably to serve as the walls of the house. One of the reasons Nick's continued digging here for over 20 years is that you never know what's going to turn up next. It's called the, the bit of wood you use to make with a drill to make fire. And uh, You found one? You yeah. found a hard one? Oh, it's rather exciting. Lawrence reckons he's found part of a half board, like the ones he's seen demonstrated. This might be the first that we've ever found that really shows the fire making process. It is very interesting because it's clearly cut and split, not just cut. It's cut at the ends and it seems to be split out otherwise. That hole is very big as mm. a half hole, isn't it? Look at the marks inside. They look yes, like you can gouge actually marks. see the gouge marks in there. That is interesting, especially just in there. On the top of you can good. see the little curves, how the gouge was cutting down into there. And then you uh, underwater looked like a half board um, used to, to make fire. Uh, but having seen the chisel marks above water, I don't know what it is. The size of the hole and the absence of burning make it unlikely that it is a half board. One suggestion is that it may have been part of a template used to hold a hurdle in place while it was being made. OK, back to work. What do you think? This is a holiday camp. <laughs> Nick's fascination with Cranogs started way back in 1979 after doing a survey by helicopter and discovering that there are 18 Cranogs in Loch Tay. Many of them, like Oak Bank, are submerged due to the fact that the lock has risen one and a half metres since prehistoric times. The submerged Cranogs show up in the water as a mound of stones and look very similar to Oak Bank before Nick started excavating it. And you can see them right down in the corner of the bay there. One very obvious one, and much deeper under the water, another one. The obvious suggestion has to be that the deep one is a much earlier site, maybe even Bronze Age. It's so deep it's very difficult to see, although the one near the shore there, very obvious. Again, the value of the helicopter, fantastic. I think we need to be out for our next equipment plan for a helicopter, obviously. Nick's research dig at Oak Bank is the first ever underwater excavation of a Cranog, and over 20 years he's uncovered evidence to suggest how they were formed. Oak Bank Cranog is a, a very complex structure. Uh, it's a mound of stones in the loch, and that's what most Cranogs look like. Um, people might wonder how we get from that to uh, our reconstruction, for example. But the story goes something like this. The first phase of occupation at Oak Bank Cranog would be a freestanding pile dwelling with piles driven into the loch bed, coming above the water, a platform built on it with a little house on the platform. Now, the people lived on this for a very long time. Um, 
We don't know how long it would take for this to start to collapse, but collapse would start taking place reasonably quickly, and then the people would be living on basically the same idea, little pile dwelling in the water, but now things would have started to collapse. Bits of floor would have fallen down, some of the piles would fall down, and underneath, on the loch bed, you would start to get a build-up of organic material. This would also be supplemented with stuff just thrown off the side of the Cranog, um, bits falling through the floor, and so on. Eventually, this would build up to such an extent that you've got piles driven in, lots of collapsed material, and now you're actually ending up with a mound of material that the people are living on of their own making. Now, when they drive piles into it, the piles are only going down into the top of the organic mound. And that's a problem, because the strength for the structure and the strength of the piles is that they're going into the loch bed previously. So now these ones start to collapse. So we can see this with piles all leaning in the same direction. Um, and at this point, people start to put stones around the edges and the bottom of these piles to stop them collapsing. It's quite easy to do because they're in shallow water. They can see where to place the stones, so it's a, it's, it's a possible task to do that, and that would help to support it. And eventually, as uh, more parts of the structure collapse, they put more stones on, it would become impossible to drive piles into that site. So at the end of the day, you get what looks like a mound of stones lying on the loch bed, and underneath the stones, all the superimposed collapsed layers of earlier floors and material dropped by the people who lived on the site. There are cranogs in Loch Tay that still exist above the water and look like small islands. It's called Gull Island because seagulls all go and nest on it, but as you see, it looks like a mound of stones, fairly circular. And it's one of the few that's still sticking above the water with trees on it. Some of these islands may have started out as prehistoric cranogs and then were reoccupied at a later date and built up above the water. As part of this course, we have to realise that uh, they're not just here to excavate Old Bank Cranog for me. Um, these people are here to learn about underwater archaeology in general. We can't just use them as labour, um, which would be quite nice to do, just treat them like slaves. But we can't do that. They also have to learn about conservation and other aspects, which we will be doing later in the week. Having finished cleaning up and removing eroded timbers, what's actually left of the Cranog floor is a lot clearer to see. But there are also patches of new archaeology showing from the layer underneath. And before anyone can dig deeper into it to investigate, it has to be recorded. Making a precise drawing of the evidence before dismantling it is common practice in archaeology, but none of this group have ever tried to do it underwater. It looks tricky yeah, even when the pro does it. Exactly, yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> Nick demonstrates how it's done by doing the first of the 25 drawings needed to record the 5 by 5 metre trench. Each drawing made at full scale is then reduced down to a more practical 1 to 10 scale on dry land. Nervous about damaging the fragile remains, this is the most daunting challenge for the students yet. And as Morton's about to discover, there are no shortcuts to be made. You have to draw them. Every one of them? Yeah. You can't just leave it with a big white area saying hurdle. You have to draw them all. That's the whole point of it. Yeah, but it's the film. It doesn't matter. No, That's no, no. no you have to draw it. I can do it. <laughs> it's got to be done, that's, that's how we plan it. I'm not particularly talented at drawing, so uh, that's, it's a challenge in its own right for me. And at the same time, you basically have to move around being, being very careful so we don't, uh, you know, fall off the scaffold practically and crash down into the site. With the students having completed two drawings each, Nick decides to finish the rest. He'll do it quicker, especially in what seems to be worsening weather. The field school has reached the halfway point, but next comes the best bit. We're going to be going a lot deeper tomorrow, and so I'm looking forward to seeing what else we're going to find. It's one of the beauties of archaeology. You never know what you're going to find. So, <laughs> From now on, they'll be digging into new and unseen layers of Oak Bank Cranog. We always meant to put a trap door on the floor because um, Herodotus talks about people living in Lake Crassius in the north of Greece. And they lived in a lake dwelling, and uh, there was a trapdoor in the floor, and they would drop down a basket, and they'd pull it up an hour later full of fish. Wow. And, they, and this, is, this is the bit that yeah. kind of rings of truth to me. They tied a string round the leg of their children to stop them falling through the trap. 
Yeah. <laughs> but you can imagine that yeah, trapdoor in the middle of the night, in the middle of the winter in Scotland would be absolutely yeah. essential. You know. So together we brought Time Team back and now we're going to take Time Team to the next level. Help us achieve 10,000 ongoing members on Patreon. After a week and a half in training, the big day arrives. The rookie underwater archaeologists are going to be excavating into a new and unknown layer of the Cranog. But one thing they've learned is that everything about underwater archaeology takes time, especially today when they're setting up the equipment themselves. It's a bit I hate being kitted up and waiting or trying to get into the sea. They're just so heavy. I mean, you can't really tell. This is all lead from a weight, so what, 24 kilograms of lead or something like that. They're going to start excavating at the front line, so the whole area gets excavated all at once. Four people, it's uh, five metres wide, so they get 1.25 metres each, and uh, they'll just excavate back. Before, they'd been just cleaning off silt and removing eroded timbers, but their brief now, having recorded this layer, is to completely remove it. See, at this stage, they're just being a bit too gentle. It's one finger excavation, it's too delicate at this time. Although Nick wants to keep an eye on his fragile site, it is frustrating watching beginners at work. Still thinking as land archaeologists, it doesn't come easy putting two and a half thousand year old material up the dredge. It takes a while to get used to a dredge, and it is actually genuinely quite difficult. I mean, I think, you know, people don't expect even experienced archaeologists who are using a dredge to find all the small things and to progress through the site. As archaeologists new to working underwater, just the quality of the preservation is fascinating in itself. There's often lots of hazelnut shells um, and sometimes whole hazelnuts, but what's really interesting is when the whole hazelnut's got tooth marks in it, because it's obvious that someone who's been eating hazelnuts has just tried to bite it and not managed to break it open and then just thrown it away. So that's what I was kind of showing to the camera. You could see the tooth marks where someone had gone, you know, and, thought, and just kept trying and thought, oh, no, no, and, and thrown it away. The big stones from the old layer have to be lifted and carried off site. This is done using buckets filled with air, but it's still exhausting and time consuming work. Their mission once again is to work their way back along the trench, but only digging deep enough to establish the next recognisable layer of archaeology. With the new drawing of C2 in his hands, Nick is looking at the patches of sticks that the students thought might be collapsed hurdles. What might be hurdle there, you've got what might be hurdle there, you've got what might be hurdle there, and you've got the same over here. So all of these areas have got lots of small sticks. And if, the, if they were hurdles, I'd expect to see some of them looking very coherently woven together. So I think it's an area of much smaller branches underneath the floor itself. So I want them to get rid of the floor, down to all these small branches and twigs. And I think those small branches are the sort of thing that would have been put down as a kind of leveller or foundation for this upper floor. Sometimes it's only after the dig that finds can be properly understood. Like when Nick found 500 pieces of pottery all in one place and all part of the same pot. Each fragment had a black substance sticking to it. We had that analysed. It's high in amino acids, so we know this is burnt food on the inside of the pot. In fact, it's an incredibly thick layer of burnt food. It's about an inch thick. You can see there, the, on the rim of the pot, we've got about an inch of burnt black carbonised material. And what we think happened to this pot, and especially um, this is based on where we found it, just outside where the front door of the site would have been, we think that it was actually on fire, that somebody sort of lobbed out the front door into the water and it smashed into about 500 pieces. You might say they're collecting an Iron Age dinner service here at Oak Bank. So far they've found two and a half thousand year old plates, a burnt spoon, and this large wooden bowl, which was discovered with a pile driven through it. Inspired by finds like these, experiments with Iron Age cooking have been carried out at the Cranog Centre. 
Jackie Wood has cooked up various prehistoric dishes using different techniques. <laughs> Local salmon stuffed with herbs, wrapped in grass and then baked in clay from the River Tay. Lamb with mint and wrapped in grass for extra flavour. The grass also helped to protect it when it was cooked in a wooden water pit heated with stones from the fire. These stones were carefully selected because they could take immense heat and were similar in size to many found underwater at Oakbank Cranog. Not surprisingly, Jackie was interested in the Iron Age butter dish and demonstrated how she thinks they would have made butter. This is just double cream and I'm making some butter. And this is the whisk that they would have used. And these are whisks like this have been found at Powell Dwelling Museums in Italy, which are like, like uh, Cranogs in Italy. And it's, it makes a really good sort of whisk. See? <laughs> Basically, it involved a lot of hard work, whisking the cream until eventually the buttermilk was released. And Jackie reckoned that both the butter and buttermilk would have been used for cooking. It tastes fantastic. It tastes a lot better than today's butter. And less salty which is even better. I think because there's a little a bit tiny of milk in it, so mm. it's actually... It's creamier. creamier. The butter dish found at Oak Bank had holes in it, and during this experiment, they realised what they were for. Just as you've used that as a strainer... A strainer. We reckon that's that right. maybe that's what that was, that was used for. See here, is a little bit of liquid still in, in this, mm. and if you're actually using that fresh, you weren't storing it, there'd always be a little bit of buttermilk, so you do need a little bit of a drainage at the bottom. Yeah. So that would be actually quite useful. It's for fresh use. It's so nice to have the application. Yeah. <laughs> the artefacts. It's brilliant. <laughs> Important new information has come from the huge variety of food items found preserved underwater. This sheep's jaw, for example, still has chitin between the teeth, a build-up of silicon matter from the grass it was eating. I think they had a fabulous diet. I think it would be very healthy. Uh, we've got cattle, sheep and pigs, so they've got good meat. Uh, we've got bread, we've got spelt wheat, we've got um, emmer wheat. We have uh, a whole range of different fruits and such like. We've got blackberries, wild strawberries, raspberries, cloudberries, which they had to go and collect deliberately. Um, and altogether, there are 266 different sorts of plant remains from the site. After spending anything between three and six hours in the water, each diver then has to fill in a dive log detailing everything they've done during the day. Then there's the day's finds to sort out. There are some droppings. What we don't want to do is be dragging everything out to look at, especially things like droppings, because they are very fragile. There's a nice one just down in there. Here, you don't know that you're actually coming to the end of timbers or whatever. You don't know where the edge of floor is, but this is quite a large one, and you can see it's been cut. It's been cut slightly on this side as well, and that side has been cut. It's slightly burned around the edge, um, and that was one of the southeast floor timbers. Anything deemed worth keeping has to be stored in water to stop it drying out. And Dorothy Graves, who's here to talk to Nick and the students about conservation, explains why. It looks like wood, it feels like wood, but it's extremely degraded, it's very, very fragile. And when you take it out of the water, the first thing it's going to do is start drying out. It'll warp, it'll crack, and it'll start looking not like wood anymore. And if you've got a really nice artifact, that's the last thing you want. One of the problems is the ever-increasing number of items needed to be stored in water, and special finds like this Iron Age paddle now need to be conserved. You've got a whole range of different things you can do to it to conserve it, but I do think that the best method would be sucrose method, and that's... Cost just... is the all-important factor. The sucrose method is cheap, and a process that Nick and Barry could do themselves. Basically what happens is the sugary water goes in and then when you evaporate off the water, the sugar crystallises in the spaces in the wood and that's what stops mm -hmm. it from all uh, shrinking, cracking and so on. Yeah, sounds like a good method. Yeah. It's knowing that almost any artefact from the Iron Age could survive here that keeps everyone going in the cold waters of the loch. If we are finding these, this fantastic wealth of material from the, the well-preserved remains at Oakbank Cranog, then we can assume, I think, reasonably, that the people who've lived down the valley or up the other side of the hills and so on were doing the same thing as the people who lived on the Cranog. So the evidence that we're getting from Oak Bank isn't just important for a site like that. You can extrapolate it to other Iron Age dwellings around the place, other Iron Age settlements. As the floor materials removed, the first big discovery of this season's excavation is made. A massive oak timber unlike anything Nick's ever seen before. 
when I first saw that very exciting timber, um, I recognized that it was something different. So I exposed one side of it, and you could see very obviously that this is a timber that had some significance on the site. It's smooth, it's oak, which is always significant. Recognising one structural timber from another has become easier over time, especially since building the reconstruction. Building it allowed them to experiment and find out how the Cranog builders had managed to drive huge timber piles into the loch bed. We looked at the evidence and we saw what was there at Old Bank Cranog and we thought, well, there must be ways of doing it, so there it is. And this is one of the ways, and this is something that they down. could never see. Look, Look at, at that going down into the loch bed there. They would never there. watch that. Fantastic. And look that's at that amazing. white clay, that is that's the secret, the that white clay that's come up through the silts. And you see how, how the whole lock bed is, is kind of that. jelly now? It's like see it all shooting around there? Look at that, all around the edge. That's amazing. Yeah. What's happening is as the pile goes in, it's injecting water into it, and the whole bottom of the lock becomes kind of jelly-like until the pile goes in beautifully to a metre and a half, something like that, and then you stop. Uh, and then the water comes out after a couple of days, comes out of the clay, and the whole thing just grips the pile really tightly. And even though you've got a pile that's maybe eight metres long, it's only into the lock bed, a metre and a half, you can't push it over. It's really firmly embedded. And that, of course, is the secret of the Cranogs. Including the walkway, 168 piles had to be driven into the lock, and hundreds of other timbers were used to hold it all together. It was built only with the help of a team of volunteers and was considered important enough to stop the excavation for three years. The reconstruction is invaluable in terms of interpreting what we have underwater. And interpreting underwater relates to what we have here in 3D, so you can all visualise what's happening. I'm in there all the time, almost every day, and every time I go in there, I touch a piece of the structure and I think, I'm so proud. I am. I don't have to think it. I, I tell people that it's just there. Uh, I feel an enormous sense of pride in that house. I love it. Knowing how much effort was involved, why does Nick think the Iron Age people built Cranogs? We suddenly, at the beginning of the Iron Age, we get a whole load of different types of site, um, defended settlement sites, brochs, dunes, Cranogs, all sorts of forts and such like being built. And I think that's partly a response to the poorer climate, which would be even more important in a, a highland landscape like this, where a change of just two or three degrees makes a big difference to which bits of the land you can cultivate, uh, how high you can cultivate, what you can grow. And I suspect that really the motivation for building sites like that comes with the need to protect your uh, very valuable land around the shores of the loch. Sadly for Penny and Horacio, their field school's over. They could only sign up for two weeks because of work commitments. It has really changed my perspective of uh, archaeology completely because you're suddenly hoping that the sites are actually underwater because they're so good. You know, if you could get sites under, with this level of preservation, you could learn so much more about what went on, basically. Yeah. Unfortunately, as well as losing two members of the team, the good weather seems to have gone too. But despite this, Nick's anxious to make the most of the final week of the field school. To put it simply, we've got basically a floor which probably represented the inside of the house and then we have these big stones which probably represent the outside of the house. And along the edge of those two things we have this big exciting timber which uh, is still buried, most of it, but has interesting knobbly bits on it. It's obviously been shaped and it has white fungus on the end so it was obviously exposed in the past as well. And that timber I think is, uh, is a clue and possibly a secret to the difference between the outside of the house and the inside. The brief now is to clear away some of the floor material from around the big oak timber, but working in the choppy conditions is far from easy. In the afternoon, conditions get worse, and Nick has no option but to bring everyone out of the water. If we expose any more timbers, it's going to become eroded if the weather stays like this. So it's also very hard to maintain your balance. So for every excavation stroke, you have to wait, spin along the poles, and then start again. So it's a good call. Definitely knock it on the head for now. Worse still, the next day is declared too windy to dive. 
with the best will in the world, you cannot expose very delicate wooden artifacts and um, organic deposits and such like to waves that are just going to wash them out because you just expose them and they're gone. So what's the point? Thankfully, the wind drops the day after and the students can get back into the water. During the final few days of the field school, the students are rewarded with the discovery of these broken piles, the clearest evidence of collapse that Nick has ever seen. We've got this array of fallen uprights sloping. I think they really are then collapsed. You know, it's like the whole thing went... Lawrence Moran. Although Nick and Barry have another week left to excavate, the field school comes to an end as planned after three weeks. See you back here, I hope. Each diver has amassed a good 30 hours experience underwater and they now get a certificate to prove it. Busy and interesting three weeks. <laughs> but given the richness of the site, are the students disappointed with what they found? Archaeology is not pulling treasure out of the water, it's learning about the people and, uh, and we've been able to do that I think from the, the timbers that we've uncovered. Not, they're not glamorous, they will probably never be displayed in a museum, but we're learning about the everyday life of the people. Although the field school's over, there's still one precious week of excavation time left, and Victoria has volunteered to stay on to help. Will she be rewarded with a special find as they dig deeper into the Cranog? The structure of the Cranog is the story, uh, and that's really the big find. It only gets more interesting as time goes on, but it'd sure be nice to find something really neat. I know we're all hoping for that, for everybody's sake. <laughs> Join a thriving worldwide community of Time Team fans on Patreon. Your ongoing membership enables us to develop more sites and more episodes. Reduced from a team of eight to just three, and with one week left of this year's excavation, Nick decides to concentrate their efforts on just one area of the trench. Piles, 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 piles. Basically, a line of piles running down here, and other piles on that side. On this side of the, pile, of the line, there are no piles, because this was the floor of the house. The important thing now is to look at the points of these piles and see if there are any cut marks beginning to appear, and that will show that they were coming to a point that they were driven into the organic material, not down into the loch bed, mm -hmm. therefore establishing that they are definitely secondary. So I think initially, Barry and I will go in today. Mm -hmm. They'll now be digging deeper around specific timbers, including the mystery big oak. One thing Nick's sure about, the deeper they excavate, the better the preservation will be. <laughs> you won't be crossing your lines then. We and, won't uh, be crossing our lines. <laughs> always cross our lines. <laughs> and if you do, just forget it anyway, because we know we've crossed them. Oh. With no students to teach, it's just good to get on with the business of excavating underwater. And with the weather back to its sparkling best, they hope to make great progress. There are a few cross lines and minor hiccups like forgetting to take the lens cap off the camera. But as the dig goes deeper, there are also plenty of finds. A mysterious large knot of twisted hazel. Intriguing bits of shaped wood. And also things that look more recognisable, like this notched peg. There are plenty of sheep droppings too, suggesting animals were kept in this part of the house. But most significant of all, another massive oak timber is discovered. A major structural timber, part of yet another layer, and maybe even belonging to the earliest phase of the Cranog. And if you look at those big radials around the outside there, that's exactly the sort of thing that we're excavating now. That, I'm sure, is part of the substructure that we're down to at the end of this excavation, and that's the sort of major timber that we're looking at in, uh, in the end of 2003 excavation. With Nick taking his turn on the platform, Victoria gets her reward for staying on by making an important discovery on her final dive. I found what I thought was a hole and it was broken off and I was very disappointed and then I excavated a little bit more and I could see that there were markings in there. 
it had tool markings on it. It had a real uh, sort of pointed shape to it. Uh, and it was a real sizable, you know, chunk of wood. I think it's going to be a really important piece of timber. That is the most sophisticated joint that we have discovered anywhere yeah. at Oak Bank Cranog. There are very few joints on this whole site. And to get one like that at this stage is uh, very exciting. But for now, the actual function of this unusual joint will have to remain a mystery because with only a few days left, there's no time for more excavation. All the new evidence has to be recorded and it all has to be reduced down to a 1 to 10 scale again. And this time there's only Nick and Barry to do it. They have, in effect, only excavated 50 centimetres deeper into this part of the Cranog. And as this year's dig draws to a close, Nick has mixed feelings. They always like to just continue with the excavation and find out more, but uh, also we're very tired. Um, so it'd be nice to have a bigger team and work for, well, work on, maybe do four months of the year, something like that. Like it or not, getting to grips with this Cranog is becoming a lifetime's work. As well as numbering, measuring and recording angles of piles, samples also have to be taken for dating purposes. It's all information that may one day help to work out the different phases of this structure. You might think it would be a whole lot easier to sandbag round the site and drain it, but that's not an option, as Nick demonstrates. You're looking at a type of site with this mass of organic material that if you drain that site, for example, the compressive forces of all the waterlogged material would crush all the delicate artefacts and everything. So 29 pounds. So it's 30 times more now. People think that we should uh, drain these sites and excavate them above the water. You would absolutely destroy all the delicate artefacts. The stratigraphy would be completely destroyed. And I think that shows very clearly what happens. It's a lot of compression. There's always an incentive to keep going, and this year it's the discovery of major structural timbers. These snapped piles are also a significant discovery. With the bark still intact and not eroded away, it suggests that they were covered up very quickly. They look as fresh as the day they collapsed thousands of years ago, and it bodes well for more structural evidence surviving intact. This area collapsed down, and I think that's fairly obvious. It doesn't imply that the whole house fell down, um, but certainly a bit of it in here. Well, and also contributing to that point is that we've learned from the reconstruction how solid a building it actually is, and yeah. that although a weakness can occur in one part, it doesn't necessarily affect the other. But the full story of Oak Bank Cranog will take time to pull together. So far, the excavation suggests it originally looked something like this around 500 BC, with a simple drawbridge and a timber wall in front of it. It's clear that the Cranog collapsed several times over a period of something like 200 years. Also, that it was probably abandoned at times before being rebuilt in a slightly different position. a sequence of building and repair that included placing big stones around the piles to support them, eventually creating an island of stones. But how much more will be discovered, only time will tell, as Nick attempts to piece together this mega Iron Age puzzle here in the shallow waters of Loch Tay. But this year, there's one last job to be done underwater. Having spent weeks carefully exposing the archaeology, it now has to be covered in silt to protect it against erosion for when the excavation resumes. It's taken 20 years to excavate so far. How much longer does Nick think it'll take? I think I out? could confidently say that we'll be done in 10 years. Do you think I could confidently say I that? I say you'll be done in 10 years. <laughs> well, I may well. It's either me or this site. You know, there are over 30,000 lochs here in Scotland. 
And the experts reckon that there were cranogs just like that one on an awful lot of them, which makes the kind of painstaking work going on here at Loch Tay even more important, because it doesn't just describe Iron Age life in this area, it gives us a detailed picture of a lifestyle that was once common throughout Scotland. With only half the site here excavated so far and 17 other cranogs in this loch alone, there's no doubt that there are many more exciting discoveries still to come. for another year, 24 years, <laughs> come back next year and find out what it's all about. Finish it off. Again. Join Time Team on Patreon to access exclusive 3D models, masterclasses and behind the scenes insights.